Good morning, and welcome to this webinar on vulnerabilities in the U.S. chemical supply chain. My name is Ellen Mantis, and I am the director of the Chemical Sciences Roundtable at the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine. For those of you who are not familiar, the Roundtable provides a neutral forum to advance the understanding of issues of importance to the chemical sciences and engineering and promotes the exchange of information among government, industry, and academic sectors. This year, we are excited to launch a series of webinars on emerging topics. This is a third in our series. Presentations and recordings from our first webinar on inorganic biohybrids and our second webinar on detection of novel synthetic opioids are available on the CSR website. Today, we will be focusing on two vulnerabilities in the supply chain, the inelasticity of the chemical supply chain and the risk posed by overseas manufacturing of specialty and pharmaceutical chemicals. The format will consist of one overview presentation followed by two more in-depth presentations. There will be time for one or two clarifying questions after each presentation, but all other questions will be addressed in our discussion time after the presentations are completed. Dr. Michael Fuller will be our moderator for this webinar. He is co-chair of the Chemical Sciences Roundtable and Completions Advisor at Chevron. He will be asking the questions on behalf of the audience and will be moderating the remainder of the session. Questions can be submitted via the Q&A button on Zoom located in the bottom control panel. The chat feature has been disabled for audience members. For those tuning in via live stream on the CSR website, please submit questions by email to csr at nas.edu. And with that, I would like to introduce our first speaker, David Bem. Dr. Bem is Vice President of Science and Technology and Chief Technology Officer at Pittsburgh Paint Glass, PPG Industries. David, the floor, so to speak, is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, very happy today to have an opportunity to speak about what I think is a very important topic for, for us all to consider, which is around the chemical supply chain risk. Make sure I have control here. You know, one of the important things that has happened in the last many decades in the chemical industry has been a drive towards increased efficiency. In fact, for most chemical processes, those processes are so efficient in their conversion that there's a drive to increasing the scale of them, as well as to really the costs that drive them are driven by where, what the feedstock costs are or what the inputs or raw materials are more than anything such as logistical or capital cost. As a result, there's been a massive globalization in the industry, and we've seen larger and larger plants being built uh, where those feedstocks are available. Now, of course, as we go downstream in the chemical processing, we see a little slightly different trend happening where those, again, that feedstock ask, uh, access or those raw material accesses are equally as important, but we do see those starting to go more into into uh, markets where products are consumed and manufactured, which increasingly have been in Asia, Southeast Asia. Uh, the overall efficiency of the process of processing in chemicals is really quite impressive. There's very little waste. Most uh, byproducts are consumed and used, and there are several critical molecules that are a result of byproducts, uh, byproduct production, which can limit their access uh, from a global standpoint. Now, in recent history, there have been several disruptions that have really highlighted some of the vulnerabilities that there are within the supply chain. Now, this is just in recent history. If we go back to 2011, during the tsunami and earthquakes in Japan and the Fukushima disaster that happened, what made the headlines, of course, was the Fukushima nuclear facility that was basically flooded and had a significant industrial accident. What, uh, what was less well recognized was the impact uh, on the chemical industry and specifically an important ion exchange resin called Amberlist, which is at the time was made by the Dow Chemical Company, uh, sits very close to that Fukushima reactor and was also flooded, flooded and consumed out uh, and basically shut down during that accident. Sorry, my slides progressed. There we go. Uh, now, that, that exchange resin was actually important for the cleanup and production of the, of the nuclear reactor. And that supply chain 
disruption could have been disastrous. Now, fortunately, uh, that facility was able to come back online very quickly and was able to supply that ion exchange resin into that facility. But it really highlighted a potential risk and a lot of kudos to the chemical company at the time for its ability to respond. There have been several others, including the hurricanes we've seen in the Gulf Coast, specifically Harvey, and how it's disrupted the, the supply chain. And I'll show you some more recent ones from an industrial park explosion in China, as well as what's happened in COVID-19. So with COVID-19, of course, there is a race for cleaning products and specifically hand sanitizers. And one of the key ingredients in hand sanitizers is isopropyl alcohol or isopropanol. Uh, it's fundamentally great, you know, good, a good molecule in terms of what it can do from a uh, disinfecting standpoint. Uh, but it's really produced by, a, by three uh, main routes, either from uh, propylene or from the hydrogenation of acetone. Now, the consumption of this really spiked up as a result of COVID-19. And what we can see on the right of my slide shows you the history of the cost per metric ton of isopropanol. And what you see is right when COVID goes, we have really a fourfold, almost a fourfold increase in that pricing. So way out of the normal, way out of the norms. Now that pricing is important because for most chemicals, the pricing is really determined by supply demand balances. And what you see there is a direct result of the inelasticity or the ability for the production of isopropanol to keep up with the demand. In fact, what we saw happen, which is something that's be, that is common practice as you get into more uh, downstream applications, is a substitution. And we saw many products start, or many hand sanitizers start using ethanol. Now, ethanol fundamentally works, but for all the chemists on the phone, we know that ethanol has a much higher flash point and you start to see accidents happening with hand sanitizer where people are getting burns from basically flashing their hand sanitizer uh, and burning themselves with it. So it's really not as good as a substitution from that perspective, isopropanol would be a much better one. So this is a real live example that we're experiencing today. Another example that wasn't very long ago had to do with a biocide known as BIT. And 80% of this biocide was being, was permanently uh, disrupted uh, in 2019 when there was a chemical site explosion in China in the Jiangsu province. Now, it wasn't the actual biocide itself that exploded, it was actually a precursor. And these sorts of supply chain risk are actually quite difficult to, to, to see because there's concentration of specific chemical intermediates that get made in plants that present the vulnerability as opposed to the end product, which is what uh, actually has a shortage overall. So in this case, this explosion happened and the BIT uh, pre precursor, which was made next door, which is made from nitrochlorobenzene, uh, was subsequently shut down concurrently. And as a result, 80% of the BIT uh, basically has disappeared from the market and has not yet reappeared. There's a single producer today that makes this molecule. So why do you care? Well, BIT is an important biocide used in products uh, near and dear to my heart, such as architectural coatings or paints. It's also used in other home and personal care products and is a very effective and, and uh, a low risk biocide to use inside of those products. Um, so a real example, again, of how how these disruptions can have uh, lasting effects that roll through the supply chain. Again, what was the industry's response? A substitution response where they put other biocides in. Again, there's always trade-offs with those. They can be cost, and in this case, both cost and uh, from a risk profile. So hopefully I've teed up for you some of the types of examples that we've seen recently. And, uh, that will be the end of my section of the presentation. Thank you for that, Dr. Bem. Um, I think that was a great kickoff to, to some of our discussion. Um, again, everyone is urged to please use the Q&A function within Zoom to ask your questions or to follow the instructions previously provided regarding emailing uh, your questions to the CSR. So I'm gonna go ahead and start with one quick question as we have time for about one or two questions before we get into things. 
So ultimately, what key risks, Dr. Bam, do you foresee in a future from what we've learned from some of these recent disruptions? Yeah, so I think some of the key risks do lie in the chemical intermediates. Um, that example that I used in the Jiangsu province, it removed both some biocides and some other specialty molecules. Another one that really hit our company high was around uh, pigments and the pigments uh, specifically to make blue colors and automotive paint coatings. Now, these aren't light critical examples, but we're gonna hear from some speakers here later today. There are, uh, these intermediates are important for things such as, um, that, that, that are important for the health and safety of people as well as in areas like pharmaceuticals. And I think those risks are really the critical ones that we need to, to keep our eyes on. Additionally, I should point out some, some critical molecules are important for the defense industry overall and how we defend ourselves and our countries. And those molecules are, 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 are something that when the intermediates upstream of them go short, pre could present a security risk for the country. Very good. So I'm going to ask another quick question here since we have a few moments. And again, everyone is encouraged to, again, please use the Q&A function of Zoom. Um, so this question is really um, related to the fact that you have shown a lot of catastrophes in a very short period of time. How would you say that we've learned from catastrophes and natural disasters that may have happened um, 10 or more years ago to get us to a point where we're actually a lot more resilient as an industry today? Yeah, well, I think if you were to roll back the clock from some of the uh, catastrophes that have happened, you know, the, the robustness and the construction of chemical plants and the safety protocols that they use really give them the ability to, to ride through a lot of really some very challenging situations. You know, it's very rare that you see full shutdowns happening uh, as hurricanes come through today. And again, these chemical explosions are the explosion like we put there, those are really the exception, not the role in the industry. Specifically, they tend to be concentrating in developing economies where those safety standards and some of the national companies maybe not have caught up to the learnings that the broader industry has had overall on how to safely operate and really prevent those disruptions. Very good. So we have time for one more question. This question has come in through the Q&A chat. Um, so, um, all right, so, you know, the, the audience here, this being um, sponsored through the Chemical Sciences Roundtable, there's a good balance of people with a chemical interest as well as um, an interest kind of looking at the broad view of the industry. So the question is, what are some of the best media sources for learning about some of these shortages where that information is more geared to a chemist's perspective rather than a, a public perspective? Do you have any recommendations? Yeah, there are, there are sources um, like IHS, which actually publish, really, you can watch the pricing of different molecules. And those, again, the pricing movements are a direct reflection of supply demand balances. Uh, it's really where we in industry get a lot of it from a public standpoint. Um, that would be the primary one that I would focus on. Okay, very good. So with that, uh, we thank you, Dr. Bem. Um, give me just a second here. So I'd like to then uh, switch to our next speaker, which is Dr. Kevin Swift. Dr. Swift will speak broadly to the industry perspective amid the COVID-19 disruption. Um, Dr. Swift is also the chief economist at the American Chemical, Chem I'm sorry, American Chemistry Council. At ACC, Dr. Swift performs economic analyses uh, dealing with markets, energy, trade, and tax, and monitors the business conditions to assess the economic contributions of chemistry. In addition, Dr. Swift teaches courses at the University of Mary Washington, which include environmental and resource economics and industrial economics. With that, we will now hand it to you, Dr. Swift. Okay, thank you. Um, appreciate the opportunity. I'm gonna be speaking from more of a broader perspective, uh, one, and I'm going to limit my remarks to essentially basic chemicals, which include inorganics, bulk petrochemicals, downstream organic derivatives, and then the synthetic materials, resins, rubber, and fibers, but also to specialty chemicals. Uh, I'm not going to talk about fine chemicals or pharmaceuticals. So... How is chemistry used? Well, uh, 
about 85% of, of basic and specialty chemicals go into other manufacturing industries or um, industrial activities. We do not sell to the consumer, okay? And the largest end use market or primary end use market is plastic and rubber products, which are then, those products are then used in a multitude of other applications and industries. But when you boil it down, the leading macroeconomic drivers are essentially, you know, a half dozen or so key segments. One's retail for, you know, packaging and materials for products, housing and other building and construction, light vehicles. Um, and then, you know, more important for uh, lately is, uh, you know, the use of composites and aircraft and aerospace. But then within the home, appliances, furniture, and home furnishings, machinery, industrial, and exports. Um, and on exports, if you look at um, much of the chemistry that we do export, the chemicals, uh, as much as 25% is exported of some of the, the final chemistry, particularly with resins. So this is just another view of uh, what I just said on the left-hand side is essentially who we sell to, but I did mention them. Uh, and you know, it includes pretty much most of our economy and society. Uh, but you know, our primary sector is um, rubber and plastic products. And this is where the, those products go to. They go into building and construction, motor vehicles, a lot's exported so on and so forth so now when the coronavirus um, first emerged in this country we did a very quick survey typically in the spring right after earnings seasons um, we reach out to our member companies with an economic survey where we collect data from them on eh and s spending r d spending security spending, things like that that just aren't available. Well, that got pushed back because of this um, pandemic and emergency. So we did a quick survey of our, our member companies to see what challenges they were facing. But we were pleasing to find that, and we did that in March and April. But roughly three quarters of the manufacturers, our companies produce a product or a feedstock or an intermediate chemical that's ultimately used in products necessary to fight against the coronavirus. And this includes, um, you know, bios, the products, you know, that go into a medical equipment, uh, you know, the resins, uh, you know, for IV bags, uh, test kits, things such as that to protect the PPE, the protective, personal protective equipment, all of those resins um, that go into those products, packaging, uh, we do produce products that go, the active pharmaceutical ingredients that do go into pharmaceuticals. Um, and then, you know, the biocides, bleach and things such as that. So um, we do have a fairly uh, big role in that. And this is just sort of a visual of some of those products. They're all the products of chemistry. And we're all familiar with theirs. Uh, I'm down for the duration down in North Carolina in my house here, and I'm pleased to report that we're finally getting hand sanitizer and toilet paper back in the um, supermarkets. So uh, we support the uh, medical sector, and um, you know we're the number one importer and number two exporter of medical products. Um, but I'm gonna, but you know, China does account for a quarter of the world exports of face masks and a lot of other products as well. Um, I believe some of the active pharmaceutical ingredients. So roughly close to half of our companies um, had the capability to pivot and many of them did. Uh, they have already pivoted to produce goods or products. Uh, materials sensitive to fight the coronavirus, um, companies that were not manufacturing, for example, um, isopropyl alcohol and, and others um, were moving downstream to produce um, hand sanitizer and the such. I'm, I'm proud of the response that we have, uh, but there have been some, uh, we've learned from this, some factors that um, things that did occur during the um, 
the coronavirus, uh, at least initially in March and April. Faced a lot of obstacles, uh, federal regulatory. Sometimes you had situations where uh, different agencies were at odds with each other, you know, just the, you know, different rules and, and, and procedures and ways to do things. We had to work through those. Uh, companies had to work through uh, retooling their equipment if they wanted to go down further downstream and to say hand sanitizers. It was work force availability, uh, you know, public transportation, most places in the country was um, severely um, curtailed. Um, state and local regulatory um, situations, um, personnel experiences, they may have had uh, issues with um, school age children at home, um, loved ones that may have been sick, so on and so forth. So uh, those are just some of the challenges they were facing some of the obstacles. But I mentioned that we um, typically did a uh, economic survey, which got pushed back and it got pushed back until you know, late, well actually essentially May is when the period when we did it. So we took that opportunity to ask how the um, pandemic was affecting our members. And so this is the response that it actually isn't public yet, you know, the final report. Um, this may change slightly if we get one or two other companies uh, reporting. But you know, all in all, it was negative, you know, as you would suspect, okay, um, you know, four-fifths said that. Um, very few said that they weren't impacted. Um, but um, Roughly about 10% face higher input costs. They uh, about half faced supply chain disruptions or lost export sales. About six tenths faced transportation or distribution challenges. Three quarters lost U.S. sales. Uh, but in, there was increased demand for certain products, believe it or not, and, and there were uh, decreased demand for certain products. And if you combine both of those at those companies, 57% uh, experience both increased and decreased demand for certain products. And I'll give you an example. Um, polyvinyl chloride or vinyl resins. Um, resins are used in building and construction. Well, April was a bad month for construction activity. Um, even though construction was deemed in essential industry, there's a lot of social distancing regulations at the state and local level. And so activity fell off. So the demand for building grade PVC resins fell off by more than one half. And, and most of those are going in directly into construction. They're going into a manufactured construction product, up the plastic product. And there were a lot of curtailments in the downstream plastic product manufacturing. Um, so the demand for PVC resins for that particular application fell by half. At the same time, vinyl resins used in, say, IV bags, things such as that, continued to be supported. Polypropylene, another example, there's some grades of polypropylene that um, probably suffered, but uh, polypropylene grades used for non-wovens that go into the PPE, the personal protection equipment. Um, held up fairly well. Um, some of the packaging that polypropylene is, resins are used for held up well. So um, it just were differences. And so, you know, what was some of the responses that they took? Um, you know, the actions, we've seen this across the board. Uh, they've curtailed um, capital spending, they delayed projects, so on and so forth, cut capital expenditures. Roughly, we believe by about 18% compared to the year before. Uh, they've curtailed, um, most companies have curtailed, you know, work hours, there have been some furloughs and some layoffs, they've curtailed production. Um, again, delayed or canceled investments, mostly delaying or extending the schedules. Um, some partial and sh uh, full shutdowns, and they pivoted um, operations into such. Again, from our um, economic survey, um, 
down into the workforce adjustments that were made in response and uh, you know about three quarters had to make some sort of you know workforce adjustment um, you know some of them reduced um, permanently reduced the workforce eliminated positions uh, lay layoffs some temporarily temporarily reduced um, the workforce is more that was about half of the survey companies more so than the permanent reductions uh, decreased hours worked uh, about one third uh, about 150 decreased wages uh, 24 percent however have increased wages so and so the next slide as i mentioned that uh we go into other um, end use markets and this is a uh, right we just finished our uh, mid-year situation now look and i'm going to draw from that for some of the remaining slides but here we rank the key end use industries that we sell into and i rank them from best to the worst performing this year now they're all negative um, some more negative than others motor vehicles and parts being at the bottom because you had essentially um, no automobile light vehicle production in the month of April. Um, so that you know, clearly affects that output will be down roughly you know, 25 to 30 percent. But food, beverages and tobacco uh, just down slightly this year. Um, a key thing is that we are. Um, energy is a key um, aspect of uh, uh, for us. It's a we use energy much like other for fuel and power much like other industries but it's our raw material and in this particular in this country we use um, ethane as our prime feedstock um, propane as well but ethane primarily is a natural gas liquid um, it's used in the Middle East um, as well as the United States and Canada most of the rest of the world cracks what's naphtha that's a liquid a heavier liquid that's a, a product of petroleum refining the price for that's highly correlated with the price of say brent um ethane is prices are somewhat correlated with the price of the henry hub has become disconnected in recent years but we use as a proxy we divide brent by the henry hub and when that ratio is above seven we're competitive and you can see in the early part of the latter part of the 1990s and the early 2000s it fluctuated we were less competitive but with the shale gas revolution our competitiveness has improved now in early may when the wti turned negative um you know we were concerned there's a lot of concern in the industry that it was as permanent um, but you know prices in the ratio have gone back up and uh, we do not make forecasts by the way this is just essentially from the um, Wall Street Journal we just you can go and get the forward strip rates and um, okay this revolution shale gas has resulted in a number of uh, projects um, that have been announced by the chemical industry. We update this, it's called our one pager. Roughly uh, 344 projects valued at $204 billion. What's of interest is that 62% of this is foreign direct investment. 80% of it is in petrochemicals, plastic resins, and other derivatives. Uh, it's sort of tapered off lately, um, but this has resulted in a significant increase in the capacity in this country, roughly 40% during the um, 2010s. Um, this is where these shale plays are, and this is where these projects are. There's a cluster in the Gulf Coast, mostly petrochemicals and petrochemical derivatives, a cluster that's emerging in Appalachia, and then there's a cluster of mostly fertilizer plants um, in the Midwest, and a couple on the West Coast, as you can see. So um, I wouldn't call that a cluster. This just shows um, a measure of uh, basic chemicals and synthetic materials capacity, the incremental change each year. And this just shows that we're in a period right now of significant gains in this capacity. And then it'll begin off in 2022, 2023, and so on but significant capacity coming on stream. Okay, this is a measure that um, kind of gets into the um, 
um, the issues of supply chain resilience. Um, unfortunately, I don't have the data going back uh, to 2005, but if you look at other similar time series of the relationship of um, inventories to sales, you had the advent in the 1990s of um, just-in-time inventories. And so day supply would likely have been much higher back in the 1990s. And it continued to decline until roughly uh, about 2011, the Fukushima earthquake had an effect. There was a plant that made an, a key input for electronic chemicals that was taken out and it significantly impacted the semiconductor industry worldwide. So we've had since then a general creeping up of uh, days inventory that are held. And this is just for one segment, basic chemicals and synthetic materials. Um, and it was in a good position. Our outlook, um, significant decline this year uh, all across the board. Um, what will fare the best would be consumer products because that's where a lot, that's where hand sanitizers are and things such as that. Um, and so um, that's going to decline. There's going to be, we expect a, a fairly good bounce back next year. And then, okay, there, basic chemicals. Um, within basic chemicals, um, you know, significant declines in, in bulk petrochemicals and organics this year. Um, synthetic rubber, for example, is going to decline because we had that loss of production. Most rubber goes into tires, which is related to OEM purchases. Uh, fibers are going to decline. What's held up the best is plastic resins, um, and that's expected. It's going to decline this year, but not as much as the others, be, largely because of the role that these materials play in, um, you know, fighting the coronavirus. Um, and next year, we expect, you know, some strong gains in recovery. I'm just going to. Uh, we don't like to make single point forecasts. So we, we've looked at a kind of a baseline we've laid out for the economy. And then we looked at a pessimistic um, scenario where uh, there really isn't a vaccine that maybe there's um, continued lockdowns and restrictions that continue through the end of the year. And so the situation would be much worse. Looking at chemicals, uh, you know, the volumes would be much worse in this pessimistic scenario. Um, less likely is an optimistic scenario where there's a V-shaped recovery, um, but uh, compared to our baseline, but uh, I do compare this to what we were saying it, um, in the industry was really thinking about uh, the coronavirus in late, well, actually it was early December when we did our year-end situation outlook, but if things were the worst and Capital spending in particular would um, slump even more. So um, getting towards the end, our, our outlook, our success depends on access to abundant and affordable energy, a favorable regulatory or reasonable regulatory environment, the state of the U.S. and global economy, access to global supply chains, and then access, uh, access to export markets. Some including thoughts, and I've derived some of these from a good friend of mine, Paul Hodges. Uh, he writes a regular column in ICIS uh, Chemical Business, and actually um, the question was asked before is that sources of data, ICS Chemical Business, IHS Market, and S&P Global Plats are the primary sources of data, Argus Media as well, on chemical pricing and, you know, market developments and the such. And so, um, shale gas, it's been a game changer. Uh, it's provided an advantage. Uh, it's renewed our competitiveness. Our exports are going to gain. Um, we are seeing changing demand patterns, um, you know, continued strong growth in China and other emerging markets. Um, strong growth here, downstream in plastic products and uh, rubber products, is that there's reshoring going on. There's going to be reshoring of these supply chains, uh, for example, to downstream customers to, say, North America, um, if they're labor intensive, likely to Mexico, but that chemistry will likely be produced here in the United States and exported to Mexico from the Gulf Coast. 
Um, some other interesting things, the digitalization of manufacturing customers and the chemical industry itself. Um, for example, uh, if I would have uh, asked a typical business leader five, you know, 10, 10 years ago, you know, what's your um, data analytics strategy? I may have gotten a puzzled look, but they're all employing data scientists and analysts now to improve their operations, to improve the logistics, to improve their marketing, so on and so forth. The circular economy and sustainability are big issues. And then there's new materials that are being developed. And so I'm gonna leave it at that. Um, as my contact information if you want to um, have a dialogue. With that, we thank you, Dr. Swift. Um, we will now open it up for just a couple of questions. Um, again, please note that if we don't answer your questions now, we will have an extended roughly 25 minute Q&A period for all speakers at the very end. So please bear with us. And again, also it was noted the chat function is disabled, but if you do have question, please use the Zoom tab labeled Q&A for your questions. Um, so with that, I'm going to go ahead with just one quick question here that I see here. Um, number one, um, Dr. Swift, has the coronavirus pandemic been a catalyst for innovation and new business models and in what way, specifically in the domestic market? Well, you know, it, it, it certainly, um, a lot of companies have, um, you know, risen to the challenge and gone downstream, um, you know, producing some of these products that fight um, the coronavirus, you know, hand sanitizers, um, you know, some you know, going downstream to even manufacturing face shields and things such as that. And whether that's permanent, I don't know. I, I suspect that life has changed and uh, we'll probably go through life uh, wearing more masks than we would have, uh, I would have said, you know, six months ago. Um, is changing, um, you know, business models. Um, as I, I mentioned, uh, I, I think this will be a sort of uh, a push to more modern manufacturing and digitalization uh, within the industry and within our customers and the such. So, very good. Um, the next question is actually coming from our chat. Um, so, Dr. Swift, what role, if any, will small U.S. businesses play in some of the reshoring that you alluded to in your presentation? Well, um, when people think of the American Chemistry Council, they, they, they typically think of, um, you know, like the, the major chemical companies. We have a lot of small member companies, and we actually have a small, um, medium-sized um, council of, of companies. A lot of them are specialized, and so... Um, you know, for example, uh, you know, it may be a company that focuses on, um, you know, a specific type of plastic additive. Well, as reshoring occurs into the North America, um, they may find more opportunities. And um, so. Okay, very good. Um, the next question also comes from the chat. Um, could you comment on how the COVID situation and the need for reduced capital expenditure has impacted product innovation, not necessarily related to COVID innovations, but general R&D efforts? Well, um, we, we never really asked the question about what if they were cutting back in R&D, so it's hard for me to comment on that. Our focus uh, when we did do our economic survey was on capital spending um, because that's related to R&D. You know, to the extent that, uh, and this is just general, I. I can't, I really don't have the numbers to back that up, but you know, it's just common sense that to the extent that R and D expenditures or budgets are curtailed, you know, cut back, or uh, it would have effect on you know innovation. You would assume that there'd be some sort of um, outcome, you know, from those investments. So, very good. I'm going to ask one more quick question, if I could. Um, so, you know, you're with the American Chemistry Council. You represent a lot of these domestic producers. So really compared to international chemical manufacturers, what would you say are gonna be some advantages of our domestic manufacturers that may allow for either a more speedy or a more robust recovery following the pandemic? Well, uh, we're a unified nation uh, for one thing. So you can ship from Texas to New Jersey. Um, there aren't borders. Um, so you know, we have that. Uh, uh, we're a fairly, I, I think, an innovative um, nation. Um, you know, we, we 
things don't work, we work, find solutions and work around it. Uh, we have a tremendous um, raw material feedstock advantage that uh, very few other countries do. Um, I mean, the capacity that's being built on the Gulf Coast and plastic resins and bulk petrochemicals is among the most competitive in the world. And so we uh, you know, have an advantage um, in that aspect. Very good. So with that, Dr. Swift, we'd like to thank you for your presentation. We're now going to go ahead and shift to our final present presenter for today. Uh, Ron, this is uh, Ron Privincenzi, who's going to address vulnerabilities within the specialty chemical and pharmaceutical industries. Dr. Pervincenzi is the Chief Executive Officer of the United States Pharmacopeia, or USP. In his role, Dr. Pervincenzi provides strategic leadership to USP's global staff of around 1,400 folks around the globe. Um, he has launched several USP initiatives on topics that include digital medicine, manufacturing technologies, and advanced biologics. With that, Dr. Pervincenzi, please go ahead. Thank you. It's my great pleasure to uh, speak to you all today. Uh, three parts of my talk. First, I'm just going to answer in uh, two slides, who is USP? Um, and then the focus of our conversation today, the uh, insights on the supply chain vulnerabilities with respect to not just the medicines, but also their precursor elements and chemicals. Uh, and then second, what can we do about that? How do we strengthen that global medicine supply chain and what impacts, um, what consequences can that have on the broader industry, not just the pharmaceutical industry, but the chemical industry as well? So to start with, who is USP? So the National Academy of Sciences was founded, uh, I believe, in 1863. USP was actually founded 43 years before that, in 1820, by uh, 11 physicians, um, three of whom were in US Congress at the time. Uh, and the, the idea of, of the formation of USP was to solve a problem of poor quality medicine in the United States. Uh, we, we see a wizard oil at the top here, but even worse than that, they were poor quality medicines being dumped on the US by Western countries, Western European countries, mostly England. Uh, there was actually a time where the labels, medicines were labeled good enough for America so that they could not be sold in England, but only exported to the US. And so this reaction of these 11 physicians was to establish the world's first pharmacopeia. And a pharmacopeia at that time was really a recipe book. Um, today, it certainly has evolved into something much, much more complex. And it's a set of essays and tests that can assure both the identity, the quality, purity of uh, medicines. And we use medicines uh, quite broadly. I can describe a little bit more of that in a moment. So what is the medicine supply chain? Um, and a little bit of context there on, um, uh, on USP's role. It's another way to look at the, the supply chain. On the right-hand side is a simplified depiction of uh, suppliers, many, most of whom are uh, chemical companies, uh, manufacturers, which are either final product or, or um, uh, sometimes they're intermediate products as well along the lines to becoming a medicine. And then of course you have the distribution and wholesalers uh, and unlike in, in a non-medical uh, chemical supply, there's additional complexity of the fact that the buyer is not the decision maker and the payer is not necessarily the buyer or the decision maker. Uh, and we're all quite familiar with this from our own lives and the challenges of, of, of managing your, your insurances, your production, your uh, pharmacy relationships, back to the healthcare provider, the prescriber, et cetera. So the medicine supply chain is complicated, even having nothing to do with manufacturing, but you add to it manufacturing component and yet you have something quite complicated and also relatively opaque. In order, for the US as the official uh, standards for medicines in the US as well as recognized in over 60 countries around the world uh, requires a lot of content. Um, and this is a cumulative content developed and updated over 200 years. Uh, we celebrated 200th anniversary this year. On the left hand side of the slide gives you just a sense of the volume of these standards. These are highly technical documents. Uh, of course, they're not in books anymore, but had it, when they were in books, this was nearly two feet thick of standards to cover the entire US medicine supply chain. And by medicines, we don't mean only prescription drugs, but also over-the-counter products, um, standards in and around food ingredients, and as well as dietary supplements. So 
why do I tell you about these standards? I'm telling you about them because the data I'm going to be sharing is going to be based partly on publicly available information from around the world, but also a mixture of US keys proprietary information we have through the usage of our standards. So this chart, the map of the world, it's taking a USP lens on the world, but the notion here isn't to tell you about USP standards, but actually to give you a sense of the world when it comes to medicine. Uh, so the first statistic here, about 80% of medicine precursors, the API, the active ingredient, the, the secret sauce into medicine, 80% of manufacturers are located outside the United States. Um, it's not probably terribly shocking, it's a big world, uh, but that gives you a sense now already where we're starting, over 80% outside the US. A second number I'll share on this slide, um, which when we first uh, were analyzing this was, was quite sobering, 22,000. Um, our standards, uh, physical standards that are used in laboratories by both governments as well and mostly by industry for the testing of their medicines and as well as R&D to create new medicines and new precursors. Our standards were shipped to over 22,000 locations around the world, far more than half of which are outside the US. That gives you a sense of the footprint um, of the entire supply chain. Now we don't have, we as an industry, don't really have a handle on this. And that's really the point of today's talk. That complexity um, is not well understood and therefore there's very low transparency today. One last thing on this chart, you take a look at the map. It's not randomly spread around the world. Uh, this is, think of it as a bit like a heat map. The dark red is where you have the highest concentrations uh, of usage of the standards and therefore, you know, medicine management. Um, and then going down from there and you see certainly hotspots in Europe, US, India and China, which are not only, um, you, you know, play huge roles in the medicine supply chain as manufacturers as well as precursor creators, but also are growing users of medicines. Um, and see Russia as well, and then Latin America, um, in particular, Brazil. So that's just to kind of get us set up a little bit. So there's, there's a lot going on in the world. There are thousands of medicines across hundreds of countries. Many countries participate in manufacturing. All countries participate in purchasing and, and use of medicines. So now let's talk a little bit about supply chain vulnerabilities. This is a series of headlines from the last few months. The pandemic has not created the first time we've had uh, cr critical shortages in the medicine supply chain, but no time before has there ever been the degree of awareness driven by a double combination. First, the pandemic just causes disruptions to all kinds of supply chains across all chemical industries, actually more than that, um, and of course also affected the medicine supply chain. Secondly, there were unique shortages driven by spikes in usage of specific medicines, whether or not proven to be effective. Those created ripples throughout the supply chain, including on patients who were using those same medicines for other purposes having nothing to do with COVID-19. So this double combination has created a lot more awareness. Two of the previous speakers actually both mentioned the hand sanitizers. Um, in the US, a hand sanitizer is actually an over-the-counter product, think like aspirin or Tylenol. Um, and therefore the, uh, the standards for the quality of a, and set by USP for a, a hand sanitizer. Um, and we were involved in those early days of helping to address the shortage. And we had a couple of questions come up about, about the shortage. And it's one particular case, but it's an interesting one where the workarounds involve distillers. And many of you have seen this in the newspapers. Um, and certainly in USP's 200 year history, I don't think we've ever had to work directly with brewers and distilleries like we had during the earliest days, or the first first weeks at least of, of the pandemic. Uh, and I think that's a sense of that innovation we, did, we do see in the US. So it's a rough story in the beginning, but a, I think a very positive outcome in the end. So there's more recognition, but the recognition of what? So let's talk about looking backwards first before we look forward. This chart goes back about 20 years and at this moment, ignore the 2020 number. It represents just the first couple months of the year. Um, but the rest of the years, you'll see drug shortages, the number of drugs that fell into a, a defined shortage um, each year for the last 20 years. And it's an ongoing issue. Um, it, it's, it's ebbed and flowed over time, but it's consistently a problem. The numbers don't quite tell the whole story. 
there are certain types of medicines that tend to fall into shortage more often. And for those, it is even more disruptive. In particular, more complex medicines, sterile products used in hospitals. Um, these are very important. They're generally low priced and they're often falling into shortage, creating, um, creating issues as well as creating switches to other alternatives which may not be as effective. So it is not a new challenge. So the question, if it's not a new challenge and most obviously not driven by a pandemic in this year, then what has been driving these shortages? Well, many things drive it, but what I would call the underlying chronic issue is quality. 62% of shortages over the past five years were triggered by a quality problem. Uh, generally, now there are different types, but generally a quality issue is either a manufacturer or an ingredient supplier fails to meet quality expectations and is either shut down or the supply is otherwise interrupted because the because product had to be either pulled from the marketplace or there's a halting of production 62 percent of the time this is the underlying issue now that will come back later that actually has issues especially when it comes to disruptions in a pandemic and then of course there are others natural disasters uh, hurricane that affected puerto rico created a very large uh, uh, issue through the supply chain, in medicine supply chain, in particular for sterile products, which were disproportionately manufactured in Puerto Rico. Um, so that's a good example. Of course, there are others. And as we see uh, climate events rising, another item that comes on the list that could potentially become on the list is political disruptions. So trade, trade disputes and barriers have played a relatively small, or I would say a very small role so far, but there's no reason that couldn't become an additional challenge in the future. So we'll, I'll come back to the quality in a, in a couple of moments. But let's talk about why has it gotten worse? Uh, this is true of the chemical supply chain in general, and it's probably even a little more true in medicines because the manufacturing for medicines is relatively old school. It uh, has not evolved as quickly as almost any other industry. It's just starting to now. And because of that, even the notion of just-in-time manufacturing, which is certainly not a new, a new idea, has come into manufacturing for medicines really in the last decade mostly. Um, so as a result, you've tightened things up. It's good for efficiency, but it leaves one more vulnerable to all kinds of disruptions. Another item I'll, I'll, call, um, I'll point out specifically for generic medicines is the uh, pressure on pricing. The generic medicines in, at least in the US, around the world, but in particular in the US are really quite affordable. Um, there are exceptions, but the vast majority are, are very affordable and prices have actually dropped quite a bit over the last 20 years. Um, some of those prices have dropped so low as to no longer be profitable, which leads manufacturers to leave to move into more profitable areas. And those drugs are the ones that most often fall into shortage. And then lastly, we talked about regulatory and other logistical hurdles that slow response. So in theory, a perfect marketplace would respond to a shortage by quickly producing products by somebody else, another country, another manufacturer, um, such that the patient at the end would never actually feel the shortage. But given other challenges in both the visibility and the transparency of the shortage, in other words, you don't know until it's too late, in addition to the regulatory challenges that it takes time to be able to produce a medicine, prove it's of high quality, get the right approvals, and be able to provide them to stakeholders. So the medicine supply chain has some of the same challenges that any chemical supply would have. And then on top of that, a layer of a few additional ones that create even bigger time gaps and therefore they um, amplify the risks. So what do we do about it? Um, well, the first thing I'm gonna share is a little bit of the work that we have been doing, which is, it's new for us, new for, for USP, um, is to build what we're calling the Pharmaceutical Supply Chain Center. And this is to start to uncover and to talk about that those unknowns that we always say are opaque or not transparent and to make them more transparent by creating a public uh, a data set that maps well over a dozen data sources. In fact, it'll be dozens um, within the next couple of months to create a real view of the up, what we say upstream supply chain, we essentially mean from a medicine going backwards up the chain into ingredients through the distributor networks, looking at things both across geographies as well as medicine types. And ultimately, not just to understand it, but to be able to predict vulnerabilities or at a minimum to identify the, the areas most, of most likely vulnerabilities. 
and then to provide tools, because that's not enough to say there's vulnerability, but what, what can be done about it? And fortunately, there are quite a few mitigative actions that can be taken with some reasonable and, and better data sources available. So I'm gonna come back later and talk a little bit about the solutions, um, but let me share a little bit of the, of the bad news. Uh, this is a relatively simple, this is not a complex, but a relatively simple example of a, an HIV antiviral. What the map on the right shows is a, um, it is a distribute, it's a manufacturing map. This is not a distribution supply chain to reach the patient, but rather the manufacturing from ingredients through finished product. It shows not only the types of companies involved, but also the locations, the countries where those manufacturers are, whether it's a manufacturing for an active ingredient or an API, an excipient, which is a name for the, um, some, some people call the non-active ingredients, things like emulsifiers, um, uh, colorants, et cetera. Um, and of course, the finished product manufacturers as well. So it's one example, the number of different manufacturers, the number of countries that they're in, and as I said, it's a relatively simple example. So in the United States, the US FDA has approved well over 1500 um, medicines with unique APIs. There are thousands of medicines approved on different formulations they're called, but underlying those are over 1500 unique active ingredients. So multiply that chart on the right-hand side by 1500, and that's the beginning of what you look, when, what it looks like to talk about the, the global supply chain. So this is one example of one of the more relatively simple analyses that we start to map to be able to then aggregate this across geographies, across medicines, across medicine classes to develop a true look at the medicine supply chain and its vulnerabilities. Now here's an analysis that goes more towards a, a set of um, predictors, or, or at least it's a precursor to predictors, but to create some sense of vulnerability. Uh, in this case, we've, this is not a randomly chosen set of medicines, but these are medicines that are used in the treatment of COVID patients. So we chose just for interest reasons. Um, they are, some are relatively indirect, like acetaminophen to treat fever, and others are more direct, like albuterol for, for breathing issues, and as well as uh, in the case for some um, painkillers for patients who are intubated, for example. But stepping back from that for a moment, so what, what is this chart trying to do? Um, we looked here at two, not the only two, but two what we call risk factors for a medicine supply. Every one of these drugs is, uh, is post-patent or in generic. So you have multi-manufacturer scenarios. And on the bottom is the one that's most intuitive, which is a geographic risk. So how concentrated or dispersed is the manufacturing of a product? If all the product was manufactured in one town in New Jersey, you would have a, geograph a very high geographic risk score of 1.0. If a medicine is produced in every country on earth, you would have a very, very low geographic risk score. So in this case, ibuprofen on the left is being produced in so many different places and countries that let's say a natural disaster were to hit any one region, there would be many alternatives for the production of um, ibuprofen whereas prednisone is much more concentrated. The vertical axis, uh, axis, sorry, the vertical axis represents the density of the actual manufacturers. So let's say, for example, you have a very dispersed set um, of, uh, of geographies, many countries involved in manufacturing, but you see there's very few manufacturers, for example, albuterol. What it means is that you just have probably in a, in, in a few countries, one, one company in each country, so very few manufacturers means if any manufacturer, for example, has a quality issue or goes into economic challenges, can create a disruptive effect on the supply chain. Now, of course, the upper right-hand corner speaks to both geographic as well as concentration of manufacturer. And those are ones that you want to look at the most carefully when you think about your sourcing, if you're an acquirer of medicine, or if potentially you're looking to make new manufacturing for, um, for any given product. So this is a basic, this is, I mean, in some ways, the simplest analysis we've done in the earliest weeks. Uh, we're only about six weeks into this, uh, this effort, but we're really excited about the potential it has to shed more information and more light on basically where medicines are coming from, where the potential risks are, um, and then ultimately what we can do about it. So as I promised earlier, um, this won't only be news of what's complicated or worrisome, but 
uh, a few notes about what we can do. So I'm going to share a list of, uh, of five, we think, really significant solutions. And then I have two slides on just one of them um, to go into just a little bit more detail. So first on the list is somewhat counterintuitive uh, to many, which is that we would benefit by fostering more supply chain diversity. Go back to the two by two uh, chart I just showed, um, figuratively, not, not literally. And you'll see that having the, the geographic diversity will help everyone. Um, if we brought all manufacturing for US medicines back to the US in New Jersey, and then New Jersey had another hurricane, we would be in a severe medicine shortage. So the benefit of having more supply chain diversity isn't only to ensure that there's a geographic distribution, but that we can become cooperative um, in our supply chains. So having more diversity, but real diversity, not diversity meaning not in the US, but diversity meaning US is playing a meaningful role across the supply chain and purchasing from many places, not only one. And I skip the second one, so I'll come back to that one later. The transparency and data sharing, I think is absolutely critical to be making better decisions. Simple as that. The last on the list I'll mention, because it may, be, it may not come up um, in all industries, but in the pharmaceutical industry, this is really important which is the strengthening of regulatory systems or the drug regulators, as well as their ability to conduct quality assurance. Because two thirds of drug shortages occur due to quality issues, um, one, of the, one of the underlying problems is making sure that, that manufacturers are able to meet high quality expectations in a consistent basis. The second reason though, to strengthen regulatory systems is that the ability to, for, um, for let's say US or Western Europe to purchase medicines from countries that don't have a robust regulatory system means that the country of the purchasing, uh, um, uh, let's say the US, the US then is responsible to have to be establishing the level of quality in medicines that are being imported from dozens of other countries, whether that's uh, India or uh, Latin America, Africa, Southeast Asia. If those regulatory systems are strengthened, if those regulators are able to hold their domestic companies to the international standards, then it makes it much, much easier for, uh, for the US to be able to purchase those medicines. And those medicines can become a part of that supply chain. So this last one loops back to the first, that it allows there to be more supply chain diversity. It also has the added benefit of creating an export market for US manufacturers where they can compete fairly uh, at, a, at a quality level without being undercut by poor quality products at low prices. Now last, I'm gonna talk about this strengthening the manufacturing capacity. And in particular, I'm gonna talk about the adoption of new technologies, which in the pharmaceutical industry is, is actually quite a big deal. Um, surprisingly to, to most people who don't work in, in pharmaceutical manufacturing, the vast majority, and by vast majority, I mean 99.9% .9 of medicines in the world are still produced in batch, which is how, the, um, how cars are made before the Model T. Um, essentially, you're, you're producing precursors to precursors, moving along in a batch, releasing a batch at one time, rather than what in, again, in pharma is called advanced continuous manufacturing and what, what in every other industry would just be called manufacturing is something that is being done on a continuous basis, uh, monitoring the quality and the attributes along the way and creating and producing the medicine uh, or even the precursors the, or the API in an ongoing basis. So it sounds like it's a good idea. Um, the evidence is, is strong that when done right and at scale, it'd be more efficient. Uh, but what's that have to do with shortages? Um, one, one two, two, really two, two things. Uh, first, manufacturing for medicines has largely left the U.S. shores, and the manufacturing for the precursor ingredients even more so. Uh, the vast, vast majority are from, from outside the U.S., and so the U.S. participates in less of its medicine supply than it consumes in the world. Well, how does one bring that back? Well, one way to bring that back is to have an advanced manufacturing technique that is less, uh, that, that is less um, labor-intensive, um, and therefore economical to produce on U.S. soil. And such technology does exist, but there are barriers. And I'll come back to that on the next slide, some of the barriers to, to the uptake of this technology. Uh, the, second, the, the second reason to bring it forward is that in advanced manufacturing, you have the ability to scale and quickly switch from product to product and be able to address things like an unexpected shortfalls or even just to move with market changes to produce the medicines that are most in demand. Um, so these are two, the two advantages. I think the second, the second advantage of having lower labor intensity as well as being able to produce more reliable, consistent quality products makes it really, really a, a powerful 
um, opportunity for the U.S. in particular. So this is my, my, my last chart here. I mentioned the generics industry for a reason. Um, and the reason is, is just simple. 92% of medicine uh, prescriptions in the U.S. are for generic medicines. It's most of our medicines. In fact, it's the vast majority of our medicine. But right now and today, there's virtually zero examples of generic medicines produced in the world under advanced continuous manufacturing. Nearly zero. There may be one or two in the entire world. It's remarkable. And here's why. The margins are small in generics. The chance of taking a risk on a new technology and it not working out is just not worth it. There's regulatory uncertainty because it's not been done. Who wants to be the first one to show up at a drug regulator and convince them that your product is of good quality with nothing to compare it to? There's not a workforce. No one's worked on it before. You're starting from scratch. So how do we address it? Well, there's actually quite a few things that have just begun in the last year or two. Um, and there's quite a bit more that we can do. Um, I won't go through the list here, but we believe that this is something incredibly important um, and also uh, a, really, uh, a really present opportunity for right now to both make investments in advanced manufacturing, to grow the workforce, and to create uh, one, I think, really important solution to the long-term challenge of uh, drug shortages and, and lack of, and lack of um, security in the U.S. drug supply. Uh, one, one last thing I'd like to mention is what role others outside the industry would have to play. Uh, some of these barriers, I think, are obvious. So ha having the, the US FDA has devoted quite a lot of time and energy over the last several years to better preparing itself for um, being able to approve medicines made under continuous manufacturing. So far, that has been going, um, that has been, the vast majority of that work has been done with branded companies. Those are the ones who have made those early investments. Uh, but the generic industry will have to come next. Um, the second part I think I would mention is the need for investment on the workforce development on the front end. It is very hard to start from zero and this technology is quite different and the usage is different as well as the amount of data analytics, um, the level of sophistication is, is, is quite a bit higher. So I mentioned these as, as important areas for, for government investment to help spur and produce something which I then believe would become sustainable on its, um, on its own. So with that, I will say thank you very much. And uh, my contact information is here. And I look forward to the Q&A. Very good. Thank you, Dr. Pervin Genzi. Uh, for all of our speakers, we'll go ahead and transition to our Q&A section. If you want to turn on your videos at this point, I will start by doing so. Um, I'm going to start, since we didn't get time to do any direct uh, Q&A for Dr. Pervin Chins yet, I'm going to go ahead and ask him a question first that came in. Um, first of all, how closely, if at all, does USP work with the International Drug Information uh, Association um, in coming up with and compiling some of these statistics? Yes, thank you. Um, apologies, my lamp just fell off my table. <laughs> um, this is the joys of working from home and uh, stepping on the wire. Um, so uh, two, two answers. Um, we are partnering with multiple organizations. Um, in fact, we've had discussions in just the last year with DIA to um, advance our partnership, especially when it comes to the training and awareness building. Um, so we've, we've begun uh, discussions. It, they've been perhaps a, a bit disrupted by COVID, uh, but, but we're, not, we're not stopping. And the notion here is to partner with their reach to a very broad audience, which includes very much the, manuf the manufacturers, but as well as the regulatory uh, professionals in the US and abroad and help them to come up to at least what I would call basic fluency, if not expertise in the advanced technologies. Very good. I'm gonna ask you one more and then I'll open some questions up for all of the panelists. So beyond just more US government investment, what do you think would be some other enabling steps to make ACM really be more widely adopted um, across the industry? Um, and what kind of policies um, not necessarily monetarily might help foster that transition with time as well. Yeah, well, there's one, I'm going to give you one, I think one strong answer to that. Um, and it's somewhat monetary, but it's actually indirect. And that is pay for quality. Uh, the, in the current time, no patient would ever say they don't care about the quality of their medicine. Um, but there's no link between the, the purchaser and the expectation of quality. 
and it's actually watered down for three or four different handovers of which all of them are relatively opaque. So the point is that the, there's no premium on quality and reliability like you would want there to be. There can be though, there can be choices made at least in the middle of the supply chain on behalf of the patient to say, I will pay an extra four cents a pill instead of 13 cents, I'll pay 17 cents. And that will guarantee us quality um, and reliability by having longer term contracts, for example. Um, and this is not an idea that couldn't happen. In fact, there's a nonprofit that has been formed uh, just in the last couple of years who is both manufacturing but also procuring medicines under these type contracts, paying a fair price for a long-term reliable supply, wherever that manufacturer might be. Um, and actually, I think it's the missing piece in the puzzle because once you're willing to pay for quality and you're willing to invest over a period of time, you then change the ROI for the manufacturer to say, now I'll make that investment. Um, in the new technology. Thanks, Michael. Very good. Okay, I'm going to transition to a question that may be largely targeted at David and Kevin. You know, as, as an industry, the chemicals industry um, puts a lot of emphasis on PPE and the safety of our workers there. How do you feel that um, our industry has really set a good example for other industries, be it consumer products or other, um, as far as attention um, to the the safety of our personnel and resilience through the COVID pandemic and really setting a good example. I don't know, Kevin, if you want to comment, uh, uh, I will say I do think the, the safety protocols in the industry are really second to none. Uh, uh, you know, uh, it, it comes with a, a long history, obviously, and of uh, sometimes learning through failure on what we needed to do to do better as an industry overall. Um, from, uh, from resiliency, we've talked a lot about hand sanitizer here, but it is an example of resiliency in the supply chain in the industry. A lot of non-traditional companies stepped right up and started making hand sanitizer around the world to help hit that demand. And uh, something that wasn't mentioned, just to divert slightly on that topic, was, you know, we've talked a little bit about government's impact. Uh, in the U.S. specifically, the FDA did take some temporary uh, changes to their, to their regulations to allow that to happen. It certainly wouldn't have been as possible if it wasn't that regulatory body stepping in, in in that way and letting that happen overall. And maybe Kevin, you want to comment from an industry safety standpoint? Sure. Um, if you look at the OSHA statistics or the statistics published by the Bureau of Labor Statistics or Department of Labor, we are either the most the safest industry within manufacturing or the second. Um, usually we're, it's neck and neck with petroleum refining. You're safer working in a chemical plant than you would be at a um, retail store. Um, so very strong safety focus that dates back centuries. I mean, into the, the 19th century. Um, more recently, it's been embodied in, uh, for example, at the American Chemistry Council on our Responsible Care Program, uh, which is a condition of um, membership within the um, association. Very good. I, I'm going to again, I'm going to again just make a comment to all of our attendees here. If you do have a question for the speakers, um, if it is for all speakers or if it is for a specific speaker, please indicate that in the Q and A function. Um, at this point, I'm going to I'm going to be selfish and I'm going to ask one of my own questions that has been alluded to by some of the questions that have actually come in, and this could go for any of our three speakers, right? So, in more recent years. Um, sustainability and environmentally conscious technologies have really been important in these, some of these recent years, but certainly, especially with the economic disruptions we've seen this year, there's going to be a lot of attention on profitabilities and profit margins. So how in the rest of this year, in the next couple of years, can we strike that balance by uh, maintaining profitability and continuing to make advances, both technologically, et cetera, um, in the areas of sustainability and environmental uh, causes. Anyone is welcome to answer that. Hey, thank you, Michael. I, I'll go first. And the, the pharmaceutical industry has been perhaps slower in reacting to um, environmental concerns, partly because it's it's there's less vo the volume is overall smaller, so it, it it doesn't have as as quite as large a footprint. Um, but it's not insignificant. 
the changes have been gradual and, and positive. So the techniques and technologies have improved to some degree, but even more than that, the the processes have changed. That's been the, that's been the main driver. Um, but many of those have been slowed by the reluctance to innovate. Um, because the innovation requires a new filing from a regulatory standpoint and creates, there's a risk. So there's a risk associated with change. Uh, uh, at USP, US FDA have been working for quite some time to actually go to flip that script and have it become an, a, you know, um, incentivized versus, you know, penalized to work towards those, those innovations. So there's good opportunities. Um, w one thing I would mention is that it's not just about the environmental, when we think, with USP, we think about sustainability, we think about the quality as well as the environment. And from the quality side, those changes, can, you can produce a more quality product over time, then that sustainability is the sustainability of the supply chain as well as the sustainability of the planet. Okay, go ahead, Kevin. Oh, I can say that, you know, I mentioned our responsible care program. That's a whole ethos and, you know, code of conduct for our member companies. Uh, but, you know, the, the circular economy, sustainability have been big issues. Uh, we as an industry are investing. Uh, I've launched a program to, to combat plastic waste, um, a multi-billion dollar program. Um, and it's become an issue. And I think every company, um, in this space has um, you know some stake in that so we've been working along the supply chain uh, with downstream you know customers uh, manufacturers of uh, packaging containers all the way down to the you know the finished consumer good very good so there was a question that came in through the chat that was directed at uh, David um, but anyone is welcome to answer this uh, but I don't think everyone saw David's answer so the question was with with all of the overall effects of COVID, there's been a kind of a motivation to change the supply chains and move away from certain parts of the world. Is this really a realistic and feasible goal and are there any risks to um, those drivers? So Ron, Ron actually said something in his talk, which I very much agree with. What's key is to get out of the geographic concentration and to have geographic diversity. You don't want a concentration anywhere. It's really not about any one country or, or et cetera. There might be some exceptions there from uh, critical materials for our defense infrastructure, but otherwise, I think it's more about the diversity. And you know, there is a cost with that, because again, for us, particularly as we get into your more basic or your intermediates in the chemical industry, there is a sufficiency of scale. And with the new capacities that are going in, they're almost always following again those low-cost feedstocks. We saw a great example of that from Kevin, which showed all that investment going on in the US as a result of our shell gas opportunities. Um, <clears throat> those, for us to have that diversity, you're gonna have to sometimes upset that, that high efficiency, which comes at a cost. And ultimately that cost is gonna be paid by you and me consumers because uh, that cost is real and it's gonna to need to basically just be something we accept. Now that's a cost of stability, if we think of it that way. So it's the long-term way to look at what is probably a fundamental lower cost situation than on any point day of pricing or something. Very good. I'm gonna go ahead and pivot to another question that came in through the chat, and this is more directed for Ron. So the question is, are there any platform manufacturing models for certain drug types that might allow kind of a pivot to a new chemical manufacturer, uh, making it a little bit easier for some of these small chemical uh, manufacturers? Oh yeah, well, so quite interesting. Here's one side effect of the switch to advanced manufacturing is certain criteria that didn't matter suddenly matter a lot. So we're talking about physical performance becomes a critical element, like it is in any continuous chemical process, not just the chemical at the end of the of the end of the line, how it behaves, uh, how it mixes, how it behaves. Those then become more valuable to be able to meet those criteria. So first, we have to have standards that define those criteria reliably, but once they're established, then there's an opportunity for a premium product, if you will, um, and for potentially smaller manufacturers to be able to step in, meet those specialty needs, and be able to share some of the, some of the value created by this more efficient method mechanism overall, which conveys a bit more value to the upstream. One of the issues is many of the ingredients in the, the pharmaceutical supply chain are themselves so low priced that there's no incentive for innovation or change, or really just no incentive to even participate. This may create some more incentive, and I hope that's a positive benefit. Very good. 
Right, we had an email uh, come into the CSR email. Remember that is CSR at nas.edu if anyone wants to email in their question outside of the Q&A. This question is the other disruption of the first half of this year was really actually related to the OPEX, uh, to, sorry, to the OPEC increasing their production of hydrocarbons, which really ruined a lot of specifically the U.S. fracturing um, process and the production as a result. How much did those initial increased productions immediately prior to COVID really change any of the forecasts related to the uh, manufacturing? I guess I should probably answer that one. Um, yeah, I mean, it was a shock. I mean, you know, essentially there was a incredible demand destruction as um, nations locked down across the world, you know, in terms of transportation and economic activity. And so, you know, the demand plummeted, uh, but supply kept on um, expanding. Well, something you had to give, and that was the price at a particular point. Um, we've seen supply in this country start to fall. Um, there's been a number of notable bankruptcies and such. Um, and so, uh, the, we as a nation, I had a nice chart, which I decided not to um, include in this presentation, but I took the EIA forecasts of both natural gas and um, oil and oil production in this country, what they made in their December outlook, and then their most recent June outlook, and it's you know completely different, but uh, you know, Production will be off this year in both oil and gas, um, but it's still going to be relatively high levels, um, very elevated levels compared to, um, um, you know, say 10 years ago. And, you know, the price of Brent and the price of the WTI have crept up to around $40 per barrel, which in some uh, particular basins, regions, uh, it's economically feasible to continue on um, production. Very good. Thank you, Kevin. Um, this is going to be a broad question that probably anyone can answer here from our panel. The question is, uh, has the consolidation of ownership of these companies and larger venture capital buying companies reduced the geographic diversity of production of either pharmaceuticals, medicines, or some of the, uh, the chemical products? Yeah, um, let me share in the pharmaceutical supply chain. The answer is relatively no. The, the, the pharmaceutical supply chain is relatively unfragmented. And in fact, the areas of fastest growth are coming in uh, middle income markets like Russia, Mexico, Nigeria, Bangladesh, Pakistan, where you see huge growth of new companies, brand new, um, who are entering the space. They're usually producing locally or regionally to begin with, and then begin to you know, raise their game for export markets, including into, into uh, Europe and, and the US. Um, at the same time, there is consolidation, but it's it's more than made up for on the other end on the innovation. So it's quite dynamic. That that increases the complexity, but it's also a, a really good opportunity. So I think the pharmaceutical supply chain sort of bucks the bucks the trend mostly around the world. Sorry, I'm muted. Any any uh, additional comments, Kevin, related to the the chemical industry on that on that side? I forget the first part of the question. <laughs> really, the question is related to how, how consolidation and, and some of these venture capital moves have kind of changed the outlook for the industry, as well as specifically the delocalization of some of the manufacturing. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, there was a trend towards, um, you know, the, sort of like with globalization that we've seen in the last 20 years. I, I think, you know, this particular, from since Fukushima, and particularly since now there's been a move to reshore and to maybe to diversify supply chains. Um, the industry, I mean, if you look at it in terms of the high 30,000 foot level, it's, it appears to be fragmented, but once you get down to individual products, you know, the titanium dioxide or um, ABS resins or things like that, it's actually quite consolidated already and in some cases, probably can't get much more consolidated um, because of antitrust rules here in the United States and in Europe and in other nations, so. Very good, thank you for that. 
So this is another question. Again, we probably got time for about one or two more questions. This will be a big one. And I think this is already alluded to a bit in Ron's presentation. So I'm interested to get Dave and Kevin's take on this. Um, let's, let's talk a little bit about just-in-time manufacturing. Is the move to that kind of a leaner process in just-in-time manufacturing really part of the problem in the chemical space specifically? And what are some of the implications of reversing uh, something that's done for economic efficiency? Well, I would argue in some cases, just-in-time manufacturing isn't just economics, it's also safety, right? Particularly with chemical intermediates that are highly reactive, they're often produced and consumed very quickly to really have a fundamental safer process. So there's a sort of double-edged sword to that inside of the envelopes in the chemical industry that needs to be considered. It's certainly, uh, you know, the ability to forecast and produce uh, and then deliver as quickly as possible is an, is an advantage, right, overall for any company or for the chemical industry overall. It does produce some risk. We, we talked about a lot of the risk in the supply chain disruptions related to the manufacturing side, um, but there's also risk when the actual means of transportation uh, are disrupted. And that was seen at some level uh, recently when air traffic dropped because a lot of uh, small specialty chemicals are actually air freighted around the world. We saw some crazy things like 600% increases in cost of things just driven on the lack of ability to get the products to, to the different points. So, so there are weaknesses that I think come up from that, that really what's critical is to stand back and start to map where those concentration points are, where those risk points are, and then build a coherent strategy for that diversification overall. Anything else on just in time or any clarifying comments, Ron, from you on that top, on that particular topic? Yeah, maybe just what, uh, add one thing. Based on what Kevin also said, that while there's a huge industry and thousands of medicines, what you see when you get down to one medicine is you see the concentration. I wanted to pick up on that um, and reflect back. To what does that mean on the, the, the push-pull between the efficiency and the robustness? In the in the medicine side, you, you less often, although not never, have uh, you know, so sort of dangerous intermediaries. But what you do have is a higher regulatory burden um, and the need to qualify not only the final product you create, but you're responsible for, this, for the sourcing of your own ingredients. And because all that responsibility falls on one entity, there's, um, there's a reluctance to have to be switching suppliers. And yet there's a cost pressure to be able to not purchase too far ahead. So you already have a tension in place. Um, so it's not a new tension. It's, it's, not a, it's not a new idea. There is that tension. But the more that shifts only to the economic side, it, it can counterbalance the risk management portion. Very good. So we have time for one last question, and then I'm, we're going to go ahead and wrap up for today. So the question is, and actually I'm glad that David brought up the question of safety too also. So in the space of safety, with the increase in non-traditional PPE and hand sanitizers, is what are what are the thoughts that these kind of changes are going to change the future of traditional manufacturers as well as the customer base for uh, chemical chemical manufacturers? Who was it? Sorry. The, so so the the question started with again the increase in non traditional PPE and hand sanitizers how some of those ad hoc changes have actually uh, potentially led to some changes in the future for chemical manufacturing. Well, I'll attempt to answer that. I mean, uh, some of the alternatives to, um, you know, say IPA based hand sanitizers have been um, you know, ethyl alcohol or ethanol. Um, I, I, I do remember with, uh, back in uh, early March when there was a run at the ABC store in Virginia and uh, here in North Carolina for, you know, grain alcohol that people were making their own. Um, but that's, it, that's a very small scale uh, proposition. And definitely don't meet USP uh, standards the, either. <laughs> yeah, the last question. Um, you know, the, certainly, you know, David um, highlighted this, there are certain chemicals you don't want to have uh, too much inventory stored uh, at any given place. And I, I can think of a couple, but also within this country, um, there may be diversity of supply. We're heavily concentrated in say petrochemicals 
in uh, downstream derivatives such as plastic resins on the Gulf Coast. And we're starting to see the uh, emergence of the petrochemical hub in Appalachia. Um, you know, it's a very large project that's um, currently underway being developed. There's another, uh, they keep delaying their final investment decision, but uh, there's uh, actually a lot of um, natural gas and ethane in the Utica and Marcellus uh, you know, that could support a, a fairly diverse uh, supply of petrochemicals and plastic resins within the United States away from hurricanes. Now there you have to worry about snow which you don't have to worry about in the Gulf Coast. Very true. Well, team, thank you guys very much. We wanted to, we're, we're out of time at this point, so I want to give a special thanks to our three speakers, Dr. Bem, Dr. Swift, and Dr. Pervinchenzi. Um, note for all of our attendees that the presentations and the recording of the webinar is going to be posted on the Chemical Sciences Roundtable website by the end of the week. Um, you will see the URL pop up on the screen here in just a second here. Um, if there are any additional questions, comments, or concerns, please go ahead and email us at the uh, C, uh, our email address, which is csr at nas.edu. A note also for any other, uh, anyone interested in these types of webinars, our next webinar will be held November 12th this year, and we're going to discuss the future of agrochemistry. For, some, for any more information on that, or if you'd like to subscribe for updates, please go ahead and do so on the Chemical Sciences Roundtable website. And with that, again, thank you all. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.